if we wanted to control our uric acid level, so what is the current kind of guidance on the levels we should have in the blood? And, and what would you view as kind of optimal that we should really aim for? Sure. Well, I would first say that by and large around the world, the levels in the laboratory that are considered to be in the normal range are anything less than seven milligrams per deciliter. So that's the, that their magic uh, number is seven or lower. I think two things are, are really evident here. First of all, that we need to reassess what it means to be in the normal range. Normal means basically average. And who wants that? We want to be optimal. Your listeners, viewers uh, want to know what's best, not just so I can be average like, you know, like everybody else. That's number one. Number two, that number has been derived only in the context of gout. So it's above seven that you have this significant increased risk of gout. And it's also above seven in the blood that uric acid begins to precipitate or form crystals. The ideal level, the optimal level uh, is below 5.5. So it's, it's significantly lower. Uh, and that is the level that's not very difficult. We'll get there. Uh, very difficult to achieve by making some simple changes. But, you know, the real question then becomes, how do you know? <laughs> and uh, what I would say is first thing people could do is contact their doctor's office. Because if you have annual blood work, gen generally uric acid is included in that. And if not, then you can go to your doctor's office and ask him or her to check your uric acid level. They'll wonder why. And then, you know, people are, are they'll say, well, you don't have gout. Why in the heck do you want to know? That's okay. People, again, tend to be down on what they're not up on. Or you might just say, doctor, could you call the lab? I'll go to the lab, get a uric acid level checked. But what we're finding happening uh, around the world now is that people are buying their own test kit, much as you have been able for years to test your own blood sugar at home, blood glucose, with a little tiny finger stick. Uh, this is what the device looks like. That's a home uric acid monitor. My last level was, I don't know if you can see that, 4.7. So uh, now I know. I know where I am. I know what I need to do. What I need to do at 4.7 is not much. I've made the changes already, um, and therefore I don't need to be more aggressive. If my level came out at 6.5, uh, then I would be even more diligent. I don't eat uh, any free fructose already, though I eat fruit. We'll talk about that. But if uh, it remained elevated, I would look at that glass of wine. I would look at um, the purines I eat, the purine-rich foods. I don't eat liver or kidney ever. Uh, I just, for the reasons of not liking them, um, I know there are some health benefits to foods like that. But be clear, they will raise uric acid. So if that were an issue, then I would reassess that part of my diet. Uh, but I do eat fruit, and the reason being that, you know, you can eat fruit and not raise your uric acid. The amount of fructose in fruit is actually very low, uh, and it's delivered to your body slowly, not quickly like drinking a, a soda. Uh, it's delivered with fiber that slows its absorption, and it's delivered with vitamin C that helps you excrete uric acid, as well as various bioflavonoids that actually reduce uric acid formation in your body. Now, you can override that by eating an awful lot of fruit. Uh, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Uh, five apples a day, the doctor, you will pay. So you can definitely overdo it. I mean, just imagine a bear getting ready to go into hibernation and that bear is eating, you know, pounds and pounds of berries all day long, lots of fructose, overwhelming the small intestine, getting into the liver and turning on that switch to get ready to hibernate, make fat, store fat, turn down your metabolism. And uh, again, not many of us are going to spend four months hibernating in a cave. So we don't need to, to do that to our bodies to make all that body fat because we're going to have food, you know, generally uh, each and every day and water for that matter. Can I ask, how often do you check your uric acid with that little device? About every two to four weeks. Um, and, you know, ultimately, if you're a person like like I am that has a good uric acid level, I don't, I don't need to keep checking because I'm not making any more changes. You know, I think uh, keeping uh, a schedule of checking the uric acid while you're making changes in the hopes of getting it under control makes very good sense. Uh, similarly, 
Um, I achieved a really good state of sleep, for example, by using a, uh, a sleep tracking device called an Aura Ring. And now that I've made all those changes, I really, though I, I do check my, my sleep, I don't really need to because I know I'm sleeping well now because uh, I've, I've made the changes. You know, we, we've adopted a new lifestyle, having a walk after dinner, limiting blue light from televisions and things. Uh, at night, uh, eating dinner earlier, not having caffeine after 2 p.m., all the things that could have been disruptive for my sleep, <clears throat> been there, done that, so don't really need to keep on top of it. But what you're hearing me say is that this is really a call to gain as much information about your physiology as an individual as you possibly can. So know your uric acid level, Maybe consider wearing uh, what's called a CGM, continuous glucose monitor, a little patch on your arm and rec gain a recognition as to how your blood sugar is doing throughout the course of the day and night for that matter. Measure the quality and quantity of your sleep. It's really very uh, helpful to be informed about these metrics because, you know, face it, you go to the doctor once a year and that is a very, very brief still picture, a snapshot. Whereas, uh, you know, with these monitoring devices, you can, you can have an ongoing movie as to what's going on dynamically with respect to your physiology all the time. Uh, the, almost everything seems to go the wrong way as you age. Do, do we see that with uric acid as well? Does uric acid tend to go up as we get older? Not really to any significant really. degree, except there is a change in women postmenopause. Uh, you know, uric acid is contributed to by uh, the what are called purines. They're the breakdown products of DNA and RNA. And it turns out that two thirds of those purines actually don't come from our foods. They come from our own breakdown of our own tissues when we go about our daily lives and certainly uh, when we exercise and especially if we exercise aggressively and do things like lifting weights. We're breaking down muscle tissue in that instance, and that liberates some of those purines, can raise uric acid. As we age, we have less muscle mass, for example, and that might explain why there's not a real dramatic increase in uric acid as we age, except in women postmenopause. And the reason for that is that estrogen, which is certainly higher premenopause, uh, helps the body rid itself of uric acid. So premenopausal women, have a, a pretty uh, good control over their uric acids. Uh, but you know, these days with all the, the uh, fructose consumption in beverages, in the fruit juice, et cetera, we see a lot of elevation of uric acid. And interestingly, when uh, there's a, a clinical situation in which women have more testosterone than they should and less estrogen, we call this PCOS, a polycystic ovarian syndrome, they get high uric acid. So, uh, you know, here is a really good metric that we can follow ultimately to inform us as to how effective we are at reestablishing hormone balance in women with this very pervasive disorder, PCOS, the number one cause of infertility here in America. So um, women generally have an advantage earlier on, but then, you know, the tables get leveled uh, later in life. One thing is I read that in your book that fasting raises uric acid. Now, when I go to the doctor for my blood work, right, uh, it's after a 12 hour fast, generally, because they want the blood glucose, fasting blood glucose. Is that going to impact my uric acid level? Richard, that's a great question. So uh, a, a normal 12 hour fast, we encourage you to do every single day, as a matter of fact, if not more, <laughs> even 14. Um, but the, the fasting that we're talking about that will raise uric acid is this at least three day fast when you really start breaking down your own body tissues to use as fuel, then as you can imagine, uric acid will be raised. We encourage that as well. Don't be checking your uric acid after a three or more day fast, but recognize that after you resume your diet, that your uric acid comes back to where it was, or it actually might be a little bit better because you've, in, you've improved your metabolism. But uh, generally, it's a good idea each and every day to fast for that 12 hours or likely even more. In fact, as you'll recall, we dedicated an entire chapter to the book on this idea of, of uh, time-restricted eating, where you compress the time during the day uh, that you eat to an eight-hour period or a 10-hour period. So that gives you, you know, 14 to 16 hours of actually not eating 
there are huge metabolic benefits of this time-restricted eating. There's not a lot of data yet out in terms of it, it causing an improvement of uric acid, but you know, the whole purpose of the book is to help people with their metabolism, with their blood pressure, their blood sugar, their body weight, their deposition and storage of fat. And it's the reason we, we have that section in there about this notion of time-restricted eating. It's why we put in the, the information about this continuous glucose monitor, because these are really powerful tools. So are there other biomarkers that kind of mirror or track with UA? I mean, so, so as your acid goes up, does your glucose go up? Do, do they kind of match each other? They do. And I would say one of the most sophisticated um, bio de devices that you can get that will clearly correlate with your uric acid, very expensive, uh, very difficult to use. It's called a tape measure. So if you take that device uh, and wrap it around your waist, that's going to very much uh, give you an indication likely of where your uric acid is, not specifically, but indicate your risk for having an elevation of uric acid. A uric acid elevation tracks very nicely with elevation of the blood glucose and also uh, with markers of insulin resistance uh, and even elevation of the blood pressure. So uh, these things all go hand in hand uh, with elevation of, of the uric acid. You know, again, there, there was this notion that if you didn't have gout, then the elevation of your uric acid was what we call asymptomatic, meaning isn't causing any problems. But as a matter of fact, it does cause problems. It is strongly related to high blood pressure and obesity and chronic uh, liver, uh, kidney disease and even non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as well. So there are a lot of things that you know we know are very threatening to us ourselves and uh, this is all about really paying attention on the front end and you know keeping people healthy we talk about here in, in america the health care plans the health care initiatives you know a government funding for health care for this and that truthfully it doesn't have anything to do with health it has only to do with illness right these these uh, plans come into effect once you're sick, once you have a problem. And the mission really is to keep people healthy, that's for sure.